Hi, I'm Megan. I'm a development underwriter within the commercial team at Dual Asset. Alongside my colleague, Wesley Timothy, we shall be discussing all things easement, what an easement is, how they can be created, and how they can be terminated. In this session, the primary focus will be on access and service risks and how an underwriter considers these types of cases, as well as some claims examples. Hello, I'm Wesley. I'm a senior underwriter here at Dual Asset, and I've been underwriting since 2007, all, all manner of risks from building regs to village green. Um, but we're here today, as Megan says, to talk about access. Now, access uh, is, is one of the most common insurance, insurance requests we see, uh, as well as one of the highest number of uh, claims generators at, at dual asset, both within the residential and commercial sector. By the end of this session, you will understand some of the legal principles around easements, as well as how insurance can be used to mitigate situations in terms of access and services. Do have a look at the resources we've collated to support this session. Our intention here is to offer a very practical view concerning absence or poor quality of easements and the effect on property ownership. So firstly, what is an easement? Megan? It is a right benefiting a piece of land, known as the dominant land, that is enjoyed over another piece of land owned by someone else, the servient land. Usually an easement allows the owner of the dominant land to do something on the servient land, such as use an access way or run services underneath it. For a right to be an easement, it must have all four of the following characteristics. Firstly, there must be dominant and servient land. Secondly, the right must accommodate the dominant land. Thirdly, the dominant and servient land must be owned by different parties. If they become within the same ownership, unity of season occurs uh, and the easement is effectively extinguished. And lastly, the right must be capable of forming the subject matter of a grant, which is a very technical phrase, but basically means that, uh, it, must, that it must be something that can exist as a right or an easement. Megan, how can easements be created? There are a variety of ways to do this, including express grant by a deed, statutes, will, implied grant, prescription, contract, and propriety e -stopper. Good examples, Megan. Uh, predominantly, we'll, we will be asked to consider prescriptive easements for both existing use and for new developments. Now, the latter tend to be more tricky, which we will elucidate on as we explore this further. Express easements can also cause headaches, however, especially when they're not drafted clearly. And now how easements can be terminated. Similar to how they're created, there are a number of ways to terminate them. The most common methods are express release, implied release, or operation of law. Yeah, it's notoriously difficult to terminate easements, and the courts are reluctant to do it where the matter appears before them, as we can see in the myriad of case law. So express release sounds foolproof, doesn't it? To ask whoever has the benefit of the easement to give it up officially. However, it is rarely as straightforward as that. We need to consider an awful lot, in particular all the factors that create an easement originally, kind of reverse engineering the right. But we must also be mindful as to whether the party that is agreeing to release the easement is the only party who enjoys it. It is important to consider the value of that easement in monetary terms, the effect that right has on the market value of the property, which must be acknowledged to all the parties during that process. So if expressly releasing a right is inherently difficult, implied release is a veritable minefield. Abandonment is near impossible to achieve effectively. As an example, have a look at Pizarro and Bourne of 2019. There, the beneficiary hadn't used an access right for 11 years. They'd replaced a gate with a solid fence, making the easement near impossible to actually exercise. And he even agreed to surrender it. But later, following a change of ownership on the party who had agreed to release, the right was deemed to still be enforceable. But I'll put an article on that in the resources here, and it involves propriety estoppel. Creating and or terminating easements can be a lengthy and costly process, 
However, legal indemnity insurance can assist. Underwriters will assess three main factors when looking at easement cover, being firstly, the physical extent, two, the purpose and manner of use, and three, any lim limitations. Wes, do you have anything to say on those aspects? Yeah, I'll just go into detail on a few of them. So physical extent. So there we're looking at, for example, the width of the area. The uh, physical attributes that affect the easement area can have a significant impact on our underwriting. Where there is a narrow country road, uh, getting construction traffic or increasing the number of vehicles using that access way could be more pro problematic than a well-established clear-cut road. We had a claim on a renewable energy policy and here the client benefited from a wide express grant of access which did cover the proposed use of the field. However, it did not cover widening the track to allow the trucks to deliver the construction materials and that's where the claim came about. Uh, so next, the purpose and the manner of the use. So following on from what I've just said, an underwriter would generally look at the current use of the land and consider the intended proposed use in addition as to how important that easement is to facilitate the intended use. For example, multiple access options, so multiple ways of actually accessing the site itself present a lesser risk than a solitary access route into the property. However, the loss of an extra access point is very likely to impact on the market value of the property and could signify non-compliance with a planning permission, which can have a significant impact on the, on the value of the property. Uh, limitations, so are there any limitations? There could be a restriction, for example, that the access can only be used to serve one private dwelling, whereas we're looking to, to develop a site for, for many more dwellings. Uh, this can be established by reviewing the use of the route over time for a prescriptive right or looking at the wording of an express grant. But don't be complacent with express rights, especially where they offer seemingly open use. In this case, it's always important to review the rest of the deed, particularly to see whether there are any restrictive covenants. And where covenants restrict the property to residential use, running a yoga class, for example, from your outbuildings is likely to be considered an intensification of that grant. So let's look at some case examples and, and assess how these three consideration points are put into practice. Megan. As you said, Wes. A common access risk we are asked to underwrite is where there is a single dwelling on the property. However, they wish to add more properties. These are usually garden infills. As a result of this, they may wish to use an access way at the rear of the property, for example, uh, which has previously not been used by the property as currently is. Wes, in these circumstances, what would the legal principles they can rely on be? Well, where, where the access route is registered, it is possible to obtain a decent deed of easement from the owner. Uh, however, if the land is unregistered, there's not much they can do. So insurance would be the perfect option to consider in those circumstances. Shall we have a look at the principles of creating an easement and see how they fit in here? From an underwriting point of view, we can look at the physical extent of the proposed access way. Is it a well-established road? Who is currently using the road? Is it being maintained? What is the plan for construction traffic? As not always will the, will the proposed access way for the development be used for the construction. Once we have assessed that aspect, we move on to the purpose and manner of the use. In this case, the access would be the primary access to new dwellings, with the access way having not been previously used by the property. Lastly, limitation. In this case, as the access way is unregistered, there aren't any known limitations. The owners either side of the access could look to claim ad medium phylum. This legal principle will be explored in a later video, but even then, the risk is relatively low in comparison to a registered ac access aspect. Right, so, so there's no risk at all. What, why would insurance be helpful if the risk is so low? Well, we actually had a claim on a very similar case to the above. The insured wanted to build an additional three properties in the garden of an existing house and use an unregistered, unadopted road to the rear of the property. The access way in question appeared to be unmaintained. It potholes up and down it, and there were no parked cars that would have prevented the development. 
Luckily, they put the policy on risk on a pre-planning basis. However, when an adjoining property owner got wind of the development, they sought to try and register the access way in question for themselves to try and hinder the development. They also put up temporary barriers and obstacles to prevent the insured from accessing the property. However, these were easily movable. This all happened as the insured was a few weeks away from completion on the plot purchases. To try and mitigate the situation, as the road was in a bad state of repair, the insured offered to repair and resurface the road for which the insurance would contribute to. However, this had no effect and the barriers were resurrected and they were even parking cars to block the access way. This did all settle down for a while, but when the plot purchases moved in, it began again. As a result, the insurer paid to divert the access way so that, it avoided the, so that it avoided the registered land that the claimant had title to. And that's interesting. So if the access way wasn't registered, there wouldn't have been a problem. This is where other legal principles of easements come into play. On a similar set of facts, we had a claim where the neighbour had lived in the property for 45 years and put signs up on lampposts saying there was no legal vehicular right of way up to the building plot and that they would restrict access to the state and width of the unadopted, unregistered lane and the fact that the heavy construction vehicles would damage it further. The claimant was doing so under ad medium filing and given they have owned the property for a long period of time, it strengthened their case. They actually then sought to register the access way given the long period of ownership. As such, we disputed the claim of land registry to try and prevent the neighbour from registering the access way, and it went to tribunal to prevent the application, which was successful. As you can see, there is more to claims than entering into deeds of easements with affected properties. Wes, do you have any interesting claim stories? Yes, uh, Megan, the um, the case in South End, in the South End Riviera, um, a well, I'll put a picture in the resources so you can have a look at this. But it's basically a, a block of, of rather modern flats uh, called Nirvana. Um, so here the developer had gone through the planning process. So all the neighbours were consulted on, on what was going to happen um, with detailed drawings, etc. Um, planning permission granted. The, the building took place and just as the developer was looking to market those flats to get their money back, obviously by selling them. Uh, a, a third party landowner came forward to say that he owned the uh, part of the access route into the property and specifically into the, the garages, the underground parking facility on the site, which of course was a very key part of um, of marketing the, the property and use of the flats when the, when the new owners move in. And it turned out that this, this ownership of the access route was a six inch strip of land that uh, was located between the public highway and the route into the new um, underground parking facility. So this wasn't clear from the due diligence that the solicitor had uh, had carried out. So, so what would you normally do there? You'd look at the, the highways plan and the title to the property and uh, by comparing those together, see whether there was uh, there, there is an issue. But uh, here, even to the trained eye, no such problem existed. And the issue therefore for us is that there's no defence now, I say us, this wasn't actually one that we insured. This was a, a matter that I looked at in the, in the Daily Mail many, many years ago. And again, we'll, I'll put some drawings for you to have a look at so you can, it'll come to life a bit more. So no defence. Uh, we've got simply got no recourse under prescriptive rights um, because it hadn't been used for vehicles to ac ac access uh, the, the residential properties before. Um, so we really it's a it's it's a classic example of a ransom strip um i believe it's now been sorted out but it was a six figure sum that uh, needed to be paid to this uh, to this man who uh, who simply sat back and let things happen um the cynical side of me believes he did it in order to uh, to get the best possible price he could from from holding them to to ransom so, I mean, 
Would we have insured it? Yes, perhaps we would, but I don't know why the solicitor would have come to us because using their own judgment, uh, they, they didn't see that there was a problem. But hindsight is wonderful and it kind of tells us it may be prudent to get cover in, in, in a case such as this where an access route hasn't been used before. Um, and I suspect it would have been a very inexpensive policy in the circumstances. What do you think, Megan? Yeah, I would agree. We see a lot of these types of risks where it's a very small area um, that looks like it's probably part of highways or um, a thick pen is being used to draw the uh, outline of the property, for example. Um, but it is amazing to see what can go wrong um, if those do turn out to be incorrect. You also can't forget about the service issue, where the house on one side of the road wanted an obscene amount of money for laying a pipe onto the road close to their side. They were claiming ad medium film, of course. And, a res and as a result, the insurer knocked on the house opposite and off offered them a fraction of the money to lay the pipe on the other side of the road. Imagine opening your doors to be offered thousands of pounds for a risk you didn't even know about. Yeah, I had a very similar claim on, a, on another renewable energy product, product where uh, we'd, we'd already negotiated an easement with the with the farmer across his where actually physically crossed his field. Uh, I believe we paid him about ten thousand pounds for that, but the insurance came to us because of an unregistered uh, track that was clearly used had been used for a number of years, um, but under as you mentioned earlier, medium phylum. Um, he the farmer subsequently found out that he owned the subsoil of the track, and uh, and asked for. Well, we asked for the pipe, the the, the um, services to be removed. Uh, obviously, playing hardball um, and asking for a significant sum of money. Uh, however, we did explore it in more detail and and discovered that actually, the, what what un comes under the definition of a highway, uh, we were we were quite well within our rights to have put that cable there, um, and we got away with uh, with paying him the same amount that we paid to, to lay the cable in his field where it did actually disrupt his uh, his farming. But the issue there is also that the, the unregistered track went on for, for quite some distance, meaning that if anyone was uh, was also aware of what had happened up the road, we, we could find ourselves in a contagion situation where it might not be so easy to negotiate. Right, well, I hope You've all enjoyed this session with us. Uh, the intention here was to give you more of a practical idea of, of um, how easements or the absence of easements uh, can, can impact on, on property ownership and how we would assess that case when it comes to us on our desks to, to view as a potential insurance policy. So like I said again, I do hope it's been a, of use and you've taken something from it. Um, and I hope to see you in uh, in similar sessions that we run in the future. Again, do take a look at the resources and, uh, and I hope to see you again. And thank you, Megan. Thank you.